Lords, I too welcome the opportunity Lord Naseby has given us uh, to address uh, the issues in Sri Lanka. Um, there is no doubt that <coughs> there has been progress, but as the noble lady Baroness Northover has said, it's been glacial. And in fact, when we talk about truth, reconciliation, and of course the most important element has been peace, we must not forget the word accountability. That is vital to ensure reconciliation is sustainable. Certainly from the response to a number of written questions, it seems clear that the United Kingdom remains committed to the full implementation of the UN Human Rights Council Resolution, uh, particularly 34.1. And uh, as the noble lady Baroness Northover has also highlighted, there's been so limited progress on accountability. <coughs> My lords, there is therefore a clear expectation uh, of the Sri Lanka core group in Geneva, consisting of uh, also the United Kingdom and Germany, to ensure the adoption of a further rollover resolution at the upcoming Human Rights Council session, uh, with, of course, the co-sponsorship uh, of the government of Sri Lanka. My Lords, there is, however, a great deal of concern uh, that support from the Sri Lankan government, which emanates largely from the Prime Minister's office and is perhaps uh, better described as grudging acquiescence, could be derailed in the light of the open conflict between the Prime Minister and President of Sri Lanka, certainly after the events uh, of last December, uh, December uh, described by uh, the noble lady Baroness Northover. And it will be easy to see the president seeking to gain political advantage by making a stink of the notion that the Prime Minister's party, the UMP, are selling out war heroes. The fact that we are having this debate leads me to think there is absolutely no room for complacency. My Lords, it's important to refocus our minds on the central reason that Sri Lanka came before the HRC in the first place. Allegations of atrocity crimes. That's why they were there. And the fact is, these haven't in any sense been addressed. My Lords, in his debate in October 2017, uh, which I also participated in. The noble Lord, Lord Naseby, argued then that the government should drop its call for a credible accountability <laughs> process to look into the wartime violations in Sri Lanka in view of the exonerating contents of a series of confidential wartime British diplomatic dispatches obtained from the FCOV via a FOI request, which again the noble Lord, Lord Naseby, has referred to uh, this evening. As it happens, uh, last year, in June 2018, Private Eye referred to the uh, Sri Lanka's campaign's similar request uh, for an FIO over these dispatches. Um, and their assessment suggested in particular the casualty figures to which the noble lord referred did not represent the independent assessment of the UK military attaché, but rather were derived from UN country team estimates, which have been in the public domain since 2009 and remarked upon by subsequent UN investigations for their conservative nature of their methodology. My Lords, the other thing in that uh, debate uh, was giving the wrong impression that the statement no cluster munitions were used 
was attributable to and represented the independent assessment of the UK uh, military attaché. As Private Eye revealed, this was in fact a description of the position of the then Sri Lankan Defence Secretary, Raja Paksa, uh, an alleged perpetrator of grave human rights violations. My Lords, sadly, uh, your Lordship's debate of 14 months ago continues to be used by hardliners in Sri Lanka to erode efforts to bring about a meaningful process of accountability and reconciliation for wartime atrocities. For example, in July last year, uh, G.L. Kalis, a member of the former regime and uh, a Raja Paksa ally, wrote to the new UK Foreign Secretary calling on him to withdraw the UI UN Human Rights Council resolution on Sri Lanka in view of the, quote, entirely flawed basis for it as revealed by the noble Lord, Lord Naseby. <coughs> Many are concerned about how that FOI request and the dispatches will be used to sway international public opinion at a crunch time at the Human Rights Council in uh, March uh, next month. And therefore it's important to correct the dangerous and unhelpful narrative uh, that the noble Lord Naseby's original debate has helped to foment in Sri Lanka. As documented in great detail, if we're talking about anniversaries, as documented in great detail by the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, 2015 investigation. My Freedom of Information Act um, request uh, was duly uh, passed to me. It's my privilege, according to the judge on the first tier, to use that information as I see fit. I'm more than happy to give copies to all front bench persons here present. And I'll make sure that happens immediately after. But those dispatches are not written by me. Those dispatches are written by the official attaché from the United Kingdom, who served throughout the Seoul War and was at the front line uh, during that war. Well, I'm grateful for the offer. Um, I'm sorry it's come 14 months late, but I would have appreciated, and certainly the sh campaign uh, for Sri Lanka would have appreciated copies earlier. That's why, according to Private Eye, they put in their own FOI requests and have got uh, the material. And I think the important point is about the narrative that we've heard this evening and the important point that the noble Lady Baroness uh, Northover has made is that we do want to see the full implementation of the resolution which hasn't been properly addressed and certainly in no way can be considered fully addressed. That narrative and I want to sort of point out uh, about in that report of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in 2015 into the final stages of the Civil War. Because it was on this day, the 5th of February, 10 years ago, the UN, the IRS, uh, the International uh, Committee for the Red Cross and medical workers were finally forced to evacuate from the PTK hospital. Uh, why? Because for three weeks the hospital had been subjected to intense shelling by suspected government forces which continued despite or perhaps because of the fact the GPS coordinates had been communicated to them. It was the only hospital in the war zone equipped with an operating theatre where hundreds of patients were being treat, treated. And to quote that report, witnesses told investigators that as shells fell, 
People ran to take cover, including several patients who ran towards bunkers located outside the hospital, carrying their intravenous drips with them. An attack on the 3rd of February hit a ward with women and children killing at least four patients and injuring 14 others. The hospital was hit again during the following evening, damaging the children's ward reportedly killing seven people, including one medical staff member and a baby. One hospital worker described the situation in the hospital by the 4th of February as carnage, the likes of which she had never seen before. My Lords, as we approach that 10th anniversary of these events, I hope the Noble Lord, the Minister, will join me in an expression of concern that despite the various promises made by the government of Sri Lanka before the Human Rights Council in October 2015, it has not yet succeeded in holding accountable a single member of the Sri Lankan armed forces for those appalling atrocities. I hope that he will be able to reassure us uh, that we will be seeking the full implementation uh, of those UN resolutions. My Lord, may I firstly 